Good morning and welcome to another edition of the Sabbath School Study Hour. We are just so glad that you have joined us here this morning. And uh, as we come together to be able to worship the Lord in a very real and sincere way as we continue to connect with the one who has loved us and saved us. Uh, we are just so glad that you are with us. I know that there are many that are joining us locally as we continue to make our way through the pandemic. And, uh, and I have the privilege of uh, being able to join you uh, from the brand new studio that Amazing Facts has developed in their new facilities and uh, in which uh, Pastor Doug had uh, opened up our new Revelation Now Prophecy Seminar that just began as well. And uh, so for those of you who are joining us live stream locally across the nation and different parts of the world, we are thankful that you have joined us. For those of you who are watching this recorded uh, program uh, later on on the different various uh, TV networks, it is also nice to be able to have you join us. And it is always our prayer that God will bless you and that you will truly come closer to Christ in a knowledge of him. And uh, so my name is Pastor Sean Brummond, and uh, Associate Pastor, Family Life Pastor over at the Granite Bay Hilltop Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, I want to uh, invite all of you to take advantage of a very special offer that we are offering here this morning, and it is entitled The Rest of Your Life, Everything You Need to Know About the Sabbath. And uh, so many people, many Christians, and even some non-Christians are asking the question, uh, what does the Bible teach in concern to the Sabbath day and the fourth commandment found in the Ten Commandments? Uh, this is one of my favorite reads, and uh, so please take advantage of it. If you don't have it, if you've never studied in particular about the Sabbath and what the Bible teaches, and uh, you can call into the number 1-866-788-3966. That's 1-866-788-3966. And uh, for those of you who may want a digital copy, or if you're not in uh, the continental United States to be able to receive this free offer, then you can always text it. And uh, the message that you want to text in the, test in the message box is SH086. That's SH086, as you see on the screen. And you want to text that to the number 40544, and you can receive a free digital copy of our free offer here today. So before we get into our study, as uh, we continue to look at this important quarterly that's entitled Education in the Light of Christianity and the Bible Message, I want to ask that uh, all of us might be able to join together as we pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful to be able to come together here this morning. And uh, for others that are watching under different time zones and replay of this program, Father, I want to pray that no matter where they're at, that you will bless them and that you will enrich them with your spirit. Father in heaven, we claim the promise that you gave to your son Jesus that when he left this earth that he would send a, a comforter, a teacher that would guide us into all truth. And so Father, this morning we want to pray that that spirit will truly be our teacher today. Father in heaven, I want to pray that I will fade in the background, Lord, and that your word and your name will come forward, Lord, and be glorified even as we study these important truths. And so we worship you here this morning, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. All right, so we are in lesson number seven, which is worship in education, worship in education. And uh, for many of us who have experienced Christian education, either at the academy level or uh, a local Seventh-day Adventist school during your grade school experience or for myself in the uh, different various Adventist universities and colleges, uh, the term chapel is very familiar. In fact, if you talk about chapels or dorm worships or afterglows and vespers and so on, uh, I trust and hope that for many of us, that brings back some very warm memories as uh, we look back on our school or college and university days. Um, certainly, these were organized times when the student body came together for collective worship of the God in whom we claim as our God and Savior. And, uh, and that's what we're looking at here today, worship. Worship in the light of Christian uh, education. Now, as it turns out, uh, the Bible has a lot to speak in regards to worship. It is a subject that is way more exhaustive than we are able to look at here today that the lesson study author was able to bring us through. But uh, certainly we're going to look at some highlights. And uh, I'd like to start actually by bringing us to the very last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation. So turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 14. And as we come to the 14th chapter of Revelation, we find there uh, God has a three-pronged uh, message for the very last 
years of earth's history just before Jesus comes. And so this is a end time, last day message, the last message that God has for mankind just before Jesus comes in deliverance and in judgment. And uh, those three pronged messages are uh, symbolized by three angelic heavenly angels. And uh, so when we are looking at the very first angel, which is what we're looking at here this morning, verses six and seven, it says, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to, the, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And so friends, right in the heart at the very beginning of the very first prong or in heavenly angelic message that God has for mankind just before Jesus comes. And of course, we can't look at the study of this in regards to his judgment hour coming, but if we did, many of us have discovered that indeed that judgment hour has begun and this message is relevant for our time in human history. And uh, at the very heart of it, we find that there was a call from heaven for mankind to worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And, uh, and so friends, this is, uh, the, of course, the very heart of our subject and uh, topic here today, which is that of worship, a call to worship. Now, worship is an interesting word, even in the book of Revelation. As we look at this last book of the Bible, you will discover that the word worship comes up 22 different times. And, uh, and so it's a very prevalent theme and topic throughout that last book. When we go to one of the most critical chapters in the Bible, which is chapter 13, uh, we find there that the word worship comes up five times. And then when we go to the following chapter, Revelation 14, and I would suggest that Revelation 13 and 14 are probably the two most instrumental chapters in the entire book of Revelation. And uh, and when we find ourselves in the book of Revelation chapter 14, uh, 13 and 14, I should say, we find that there are seven times that the word worship comes up and all seven times of those, it is warning us against the deception of the evil one, against worshiping both Satan as well as his biggest religious project in all of history and, uh, and the beast power of Revelation chapter 13, warning us against both worshiping it as well as receiving its mark on our forehead or on our hand. And, uh, and then, of course, as we just read in Revelation chapter 14, the word worship comes up once where it calls for us to make the best decision, the wisest decision, the life-giving decision of actually worshiping the true God of heaven. And all that the Bible tells us is wrapped up in what true biblical worship is. And uh, so worship of God is uh, very, very important. Worship of God was first challenged in the Garden of Eden. Uh, When we read the second chapter of uh, Genesis, we find there is, or sorry, the third chapter of Genesis, we find there that there is an invitation by the serpent who is being inspired and is a mouthpiece for Satan to be able to uh, start to give our worship to something else besides the Lord. And uh, sadly, as we look at the next generation, we find that one of the first children of Adam and Eve also chose a different path of worship, a path of worship that was not inspired by God, but was giving glory rather to the enemy of God himself. And as we follow through the scriptures and the pages of the Bible, we discover that indeed uh, God has been challenged for worship. There has been a challenge uh, to his throne for us to be able to choose either the true God of heaven and worship him or worship Satan in the various different ways in which he has developed different religions and non-religions to be able to receive that worship um, himself. Now, the Bible also reveals that the God's challenge uh, in concern to worship of his created beings did not begin here on this planet, but the Bible actually reveals that this particular challenge for God's worship began even before the foundation of this world, before mankind came to be. Uh, Who knows how long beforehand, but the Bible makes it very clear that even before the world came to be, that uh, a very exalted, beautiful, and holy angel, who originally was named Lucifer, came to challenge God for worship from the heavenly beings of heaven itself. I want to read for you uh, a quote from Isaiah chapter 14, 
and uh, verses 12 through 14, where we find one of the key revelations in regards to that challenge for worship. And uh, so it goes like this. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation, on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. And uh, so very clearly, we find here that Lucifer was found with a very serious eye problem. And, uh, and of course, that's our problem as well. We have inherited that since Adam and Eve first decided to give at least some of their temporary worship to Satan, brought sin upon this world. And uh, ever since then, we also are born with an eye problem, self-centeredness, pride, and so on. And, uh, and so we find here that Lucifer was the first originator of this particular sin and mindset, this, this kind of headspace that he found himself in. And because he was so powerful, because he had so much influence, and he was at the right hand of Christ and the Father, he decided that being at the right hand of Christ and the Father was not, not enough, but rather he decided that he wanted to replace Christ and or the Father on their throne, that he might receive the worship, the ultimate worship of the heavenly beings that only Christ and the Father truly are capable of receiving and not letting it get to their head, and of course, capable and deserving of that worship as well. And so friends, in light of what the Bible says, both in the last day's message that we find in Revelation, and then also in the history book of the history books of the Bible from Genesis onward, does this make the subject of worship a very important topic? Well, yes, it does. It certainly does. Um, True worship is so central to the Christian experience that all faithful Christian education must deal with the question of worship. And it is important for us as educators to be able to bring our children, both in the home as parental educators, as well as educators in our different academies, schools, universities, and colleges, and to be able to help establish our children in what the Bible teaches concerning true worship and then to encourage them to make that best choice that we can possibly make to worship the Lord our God with all our heart, our strength, and our mind. And so that's the subject that we're looking at. Sunday, uh, we have some interesting things that are brought up. So if you have your quarterly with you, uh, turn with me uh, to Sunday's uh, lesson study. And uh, in Sunday's lesson study, it says, we all worship uh, something. And isn't that the truth? We all worship something. Now, when we study human history, it reveals that we have worshipped many different things uh, in various levels at different ways uh, under the name of religion. Uh, The quarterly points us back to the ancient Egyptian society that existed in Moses' day. And uh, we have discovered that indeed there was a plethora of different gods uh, in which the uh, Egyptians were found worshiping. Pharaoh was one of them, but there was also the sun god. There was the god of the flies. There was the god of the frogs. There was the god of the Nile. And uh, indeed, by the way, that is, uh, it was not by coincidence that God, when he brought his judgment plagues upon Egypt to be able to free Israel, that he had chosen to be able to uh, turn the Nile that was thought to be the greatest blessing and certainly on a physical basis was for the Egyptian society and was the key, one of the keys that made them the most prosperous superpower of the world. And so this was very important on two counts. Uh, Number one, this was revealing both to the Egyptians as well as to the Israelites Uh, first to the Egyptians, that their gods that they had chosen, that they had believed were very real divine deities that could bless them and prosper them and benefit them in different ways, were actually deceptive, false forms of worship in gods. And second of all, God was then breaking the ties as much as he possibly could in the hearts of the Israelites that had been duped during the centuries that they had been integrated into this culture, that indeed these different gods and their forms of worship was something that was actually a deception and that God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is actually the God of the Nile. 
the God of Jacob and uh, of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob was the God of the frogs, was the God of all these different entities and creatures and beautiful things that prospered the nation of Egypt actually came from the true creating God of the Bible and of Israel. And, uh, and so there's two very important uh, 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 accounts or fronts in which God was able to, uh, to liberate as many people, both within the Egyptians and, and the Israelites, in regards to these various false gods and various false forms of worship. And of course, Egypt is just an example of many nations throughout all of history. We find that the vast majority of mankind and the vast majority of all nations in all of human recorded history is found worshiping in different false ways towards different false gods. It reveals that indeed the devil has specialized in religion. That is where he pours most of his energies into uh, throughout history and even is pouring vast resources into that same project even here today. But of course, we live in a day and age, especially in some countries like the United States of America and Europe, Australia and other developed countries where we find that, uh, um, that we're leaving religion altogether. There is a growing population of people. Um, especially in our educational systems that is grooming the newer generations to reject a God of any kind and uh, instead adopt a naturalistic, materialistic, atheistic kind of worldview and conclusion, both in regards to our origins, our history, our past, and then, of course, the unknown future. And, uh, but in the light of that, we can still find ourselves worshiping, as the quarterly points out for us. Uh, we can find ourselves worshiping ourselves. Um, I have to confess that I was uh, steeped in this before I met the Lord. By the time I was 20 years old, I was a major worshiper of myself. Me, myself, and I. Uh, numero uno, this is who I looked out first, and uh, looked out for first. And, uh, and I know I wasn't alone at that point. By God's grace, he had called me. He had, uh, I had been wise enough to respond, and uh, that same summer when I turned 21, I became born again, and God had started to take my focus off myself and started to put it upon the one who made me, who saved me, and loves me with an unending love. And uh, so, Father, uh, friends, I'm just so thankful for that. So we can find ourselves worshiping ourselves. We can find ourselves worshiping fame, money, power, sex, rock stars, pop stars, celebrities. Friends, there's a long list of different things and people that we can put our worship in. And uh, so I just want to read a uh, quote from the uh, quarterly on Sunday, and that's page 57 if you haven't opened your quarterly yet. And uh, it's smack dab in the middle. There's just one sentence that I want to read. It says, whatever we love the most, whatever we focus most of our attention on, whatever we live for, that is what we worship. And uh, friends, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think that really uh, hits the nail on the head in regards to uh, where we can derail or we, where we can find ourselves, perhaps like myself who was raised secular, uh, just experience being off the rails of worshiping the true God uh, for whatever time in your life before you meet uh, the Lord. And so whatever we love the most, and I brought to my mind when I read this and was studying the quarterly for a Sabbath school here today, and, uh, and that is one of the most instrumental. In fact, Jesus says this is the most instrumental, most important verse in all of the Bible. And it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. Uh, and it calls for us in the midst of that most important verse to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul and with all of our strength. And, uh, and, and so friends, this is the greatest commandment of all. And the second one is like it, Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus says all of the law and the prophets hang on these two greatest of all commandments. And the greatest of the two is to love the Lord your God with everything that you have. Friends, this is at the very heart of worship as well, is it not? And so friends, the topic that we're looking at today is also found in the greatest commandment and most important verse in all of the Bible. And so love must be at the heart of our worship of the true God. So choosing the true God is important, of course. You need to start with the right and only living God, even as the Bible says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. 
Uh, God points that out in multiple places and multiple times throughout the Bible that we might choose the right God. The first commandment itself says, you shall have no other gods before me. And so God says, listen, I, the Lord, the Lord God is one and, uh, and he is the only one. And so loving and choosing that true God and then having a foundation of real, genuine love for God is absolutely important in true worship. But I want to talk about something else in regards to worship. And uh, we can find that principle and call in some of the first pages of the Bible. Come with me to 1 Kings in chapter 18. And uh, so again, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to join me here this morning. Uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, and uh, we're looking at verse 21. 1 Kings chapter 18, and verse 21. And, and this is in the setting of one of the greatest, most m- biggest milestones in the history of all of Israel. Israel had found themselves derailed as a nation in a very serious way. The king and its queen had led the way in derailing the country from worshiping the true God. And not only did they start to worship the false god of Baal and, and uh, Moloch and, and uh, a number of different false, Ashtoreth and so on, uh, you know, they also found themselves uh, uh, leaving the scriptures, leaving the commandments of God. And, uh, and worshiping this other God. And so God had brought it to heads through one of his most important and greatest prophets of history, and that is the prophet Elijah. And, uh, and so Elijah comes out of hiding because the king was after his head after he had declared God's declaration that they would not have rain upon the land. And they didn't for three years. And so there's a serious drought upon the land. They were suffering physically in a very real way. And uh, Elijah says, let's meet on the top of Mount Carmel, one of the mountains in, in the vicinity of Galilee in northern Israel. And, uh, and so they met there. And, uh, and so as Elijah was having this great showdown between the, the false god Baal and uh, the true god Yahweh, the, the god of Israel, um, we find there that Elijah, as he addresses the people, starts with this declaration. He says, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Now they did answer the Lord in that call uh, when it all came to its conclusion and fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice that Elijah had set up, had soaked with water and, uh, and, and God supernaturally, very powerfully, it consumed not only that sacrifice, but all the rocks and the water that that, uh, that sacrifice was laid upon. But what we want to pick up here in the context of this very powerful story is those first words that Elijah shared with the people of Israel. And he's saying, listen, if the Lord is God, it just doesn't say believe in him and believe that he exists. It actually says, if the Lord is God, follow him. And, uh, and friends, I fear that this has been all too lost in much of what is called Christianity uh, uh, today. Uh, we need to follow God. This is part of our worship. And, uh, and, and it points us to who is our final authority. And, uh, and this is what Elijah was inspired to challenge the people with. Not to believe only that Yahweh exists and Baal doesn't, but also to choose to worship him by choosing him as our ultimate authority that we will follow him wherever he tells us to go, that he is the master of our life, that he is the Lord of our life. You know, so often as Christians, I think we refer to Jesus and God as our Lord or as the Lord, um, but we've forgotten what Lord actually means. Means that he is the master of your life, that he is the final say, that he is the final authority in regards to what is truth, in regards to doctrine, as well as in regards to direction for your life. Friends, I know that many have started to experience that already, even as I've had the privilege of experiencing. But uh, if you haven't experienced that, I want to encourage you to respond to these words that God has brought to us through Elijah. That if Yahweh, the God of the Bible, is truly God, then we need to believe in his existence, yes. We need to choose him of of all the plethora of gods that we can choose from. But then we also must choose to follow him and surrender our lives and our hearts to him. And when we do that, friends, we will never be the same. I guarantee you. I experienced it when I was first uh, turning 21 that summer, and I've experienced it now for the last 30-something years. Uh, God is truly alive and well, and uh, the God of the Bible is the one that changes our heart and works with us in a very real way. 
Now, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, uh, as God is describing those who are faithful and choose the God and follow him, even as Elijah had challenged his generation of Israel to follow, we find that it says this key sentence. It says, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And so, friends, we find it in the first books of the Bible as we looked at 1 Kings chapter 18, but we also find it in the very last chapters in the last book of the Bible in which God calls us to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord, as the one in whom you've chosen not only to believe exists, but that you've put your, your life in the hands of the Almighty and that you have come to discover that indeed he loves you and will, will change you and, and, and strengthen you and, uh, and give you that abundant life that Jesus talked about that he came to give. Friends, the devil has convinced too many of us that worship is limited to only singing, praying, and attending church. And I don't want to say that in such a way that, that it diminishes those essential elements that God has clearly modeled, both through his New Testament church and the Old Testament, as well as given us instructions that we are to have a holy convocation, that we are to gather together as believers and to be able to worship the Lord and lift him up, that we are to sing our praises as one. And uh, it tells us even Isaiah 66 that from every new moon, from every Sabbath to Sabbath, that we will come together, friends, and we will find ourselves worshiping on the Sabbath day collectively before the Lord. And so this is an important element, but again, I believe that the devil has convinced too many of us as Christians that that's the beginning and the end of what we call worship, of what God calls worship. But friends, we've already started to discover in the Bible that that's just not true. Jesus said it the strongest when he was preaching the greatest sermon that was ever preached on the Mount of Olives. And as he was preaching that great inauguration sermon before the hearers that day, God had made certain that every word was recorded for you and I. And as we come to the concluding words of that great sermon in verse 21 of the seventh chapter of Matthew, again, that's Matthew chapter seven, starting with verse 21 through verse 24. I read it again here this morning. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And friends, these are church-going, active, worshiping Christians, yes or no? Sure it is. Okay, friends, these are people that use the name of Jesus on a regular basis. These are people that are in church on a regular basis. Verse 23, Jesus sadly says, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, friends, they had chosen a different authority, maybe themselves, maybe it was the culture and their peer pressure and their family uh, traditions and morals and ethics, friends. But God has told us that when we truly make Jesus our Lord and our Savior, when we truly give him all of our worship and love him with all of our strength, of all of our heart, and with all of our soul, that, friends, then it is then that we find ourselves in a right place. If our worship service doesn't include an attitude of surrendered obedience to God's law and sayings, Jesus tells us in that same passage, we are still lost and without the Spirit of God. And so being active, church-going, worshiping Christians doesn't guarantee our salvation. Peter said it in another way. He said it very succinctly and very clearly for you and I in Acts chapter 5 and verse 32 when he stated before the religious leaders of Israel of his day that had called them on the carpet and were trying to, to, to force them and, and, and have them stop preaching in the name of Jesus and the gospel of Christ. And he said to them, we are his witnesses, his with a capital H, that's Jesus. We are Christ's witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And so here Peter is again reiterating the fact that the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer can only come in the life of a human being, can only exist when we surrender everything before him. And so friends, our whole entire life experience must be an experience of worship, not just during those hours in chapels or dorm worships or church services on Sabbath or Sunday mornings. 
In Daniel chapter 3, we find that uh, the quarterly points us to some uh, very faithful Jewish friends of Daniel. And uh, these particular three friends uh, found themselves in a very difficult situation in regards to their authority, uh, in regards to their God's authority in their life, and, uh, and their worship of God. And, uh, and so, of course, we don't have time to read the entire story, but uh, to put it in a nutshell, uh, the king of Babylon, in which they were servants and slaves and captives, uh, found themselves serving in the king's court. And uh, because of that, uh, they, as well as every single important name, leader, judge, and so on that existed throughout all of the entire vast empire of Babylon, was called together and in one collective service, under the, under the signal of a great orchestra of music, was to bow down there on the plains of Dura before this great golden image that we can only assume is that of the great King Nebuchadnezzar himself. And so as Nebuchadnezzar was having this worship service that was not extracurricular, it was not an option for those who were the leaders and the biggest names in Babylon, but rather it was a required activity. And he had a very hot furnace to be able to enforce that and to encourage you to be able to follow his commands. We find that three of those Jewish people, those Jewish young men, uh, the friends of Daniel, uh, found themselves uh, forced to be able to decide who is my ultimate authority? Who do I truly worship and love from my heart? And once they had determined that indeed the God of Israel was the only God in whom they would worship, And as they recollected those first two great commandments of the Ten Commandments that God had given to them, and as they recalled that God had said, you shall have no other gods before me, and as they recalled that the second commandment had told them as well, straight for the Lord himself, you shall not make for yourselves any carved image of anything, of the likeness of anything in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. You shall not bow down to them and worship them. And so, friends, as they recounted those two great commandments and as they regarded their love and, and their surrender before their Lord and the, and the surrendered obedience that they had given to them, they decided that no matter what comes before them, whether they are incinerated in the furnace or whether the Lord delivers them that day, they would not bow down and worship that image. Friends, this is one of the most powerful examples that we have in all of Scripture that helps us to, and models for us that we must follow God no matter where he asks us to go. Friends, history is full of millions of faithful followers of Christ that unlike those three uh, Hebrews that were miraculously uh, delivered as many have been delivered over history, but friends, history book has millions on the records in which they were incinerated in which they were burnt at the stake, in which they were found in finding themselves dying on a cross as they were crucified as the Lord had been, and uh, dying in dungeons from starvation and deprivation and so on. Lord, there is, friends, there is a plethora of, of, of martyrs throughout history that have revealed that God was the one that they had decided to worship with their heart no matter where that consequence might be. And uh, friends, I look forward to meeting and eating and fellowshipping with those martyrs uh, when Jesus comes and the resurrection of life takes place and we are able to, to eat with our Lord around the table and they can tell their stories and how the Holy Spirit and God's presence had strengthened them when they had made that decision. When we can sit down with the three Hebrew faithfuls that day and be able to uh, share some of the details that the Bible is not able to record for us even today. Well, then we go to Monday's lesson, and Monday's lesson is interesting because it points us to a psalm, Psalm 78, and it's a psalm of praise. It's a psalm of worship. Uh, I think it was the chief uh, of the uh, singing Levites, uh, Asaph, that had been inspired to write that particular uh, psalm. And uh, as, the, as the quarterly points out, a psalm in the original Hebrew actually means songs of praise. And uh, even today, if we were to modernize that word psalms, it's actually an outdated English word that literally means songs. And, uh, and so friends, this is a beautiful inspired book that uh, covers a, just a whole range of life experiences and uh, faith and struggles and victories and so on. Uh, but in the midst of it, we find Psalm 78. And um, in Psalm 78, uh, it, I'm just going to read two verses because it's just These passages are just too long for us to be able to cover here this morning. But if you haven't read it all, I encourage you to read it all. 
Verses in 5 and 7 is where I'd like to point out and uh, focus here this morning. It says, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare to them, them to their children. Sounds a whole lot like Christian education, doesn't it? That they might know them, passing on knowledge. And, uh, and it tells us that we bring it to our children. That they might set their hope in God. This is the ultimate hope. This is the ultimate goal, as the quarterly asks us that question. What is the goal of this psalm? What is the goal of worship? And what is the goal of Christian education? that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And uh, and so friends, when we establish those roots with our children and help them to know both the law of God, as it points out, his commandments to be sure, but in addition to that, also history, Christian history, Seventh-day Adventist history, sharing with them the different stories of how God had delivered them and had led them in some very powerful ways. Friends, there is some of the most fascinating history that you could find, both in the history of the Christian church in general, and then also in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist prophetic movement that we are involved in here as well. Powerful stories of how God had allowed this small, fledging, fledgling group of believers to take these new truths, including the Sabbath of the Ten Commandment, and to be able to establish themselves and expand to the point now where they, the Seventh-day Adventist movement is the second largest Christian denomination in the world. And, uh, and it is the fastest growing denomination in the world today as well. It has one of the largest, by far, educational systems, Christian educational systems, and uh, medical and hospital systems across the world. And so teaching our children these histories, of, of these history stories about how God has led in the past can be so helpful for helping our children to set their hope in God and know that he is still living today, that he didn't just live in Moses' day, that he wasn't just alive during the days of Christ some 2,000 years ago. He is still alive and willing, alive and willing to work in your life today. And, uh, and so friends, I want to encourage you uh, to teach our children, both in our schools and in our homes, and, uh, and uh, friends, I'm not sure if we've covered that in this quarterly yet. I'm sure it will, of the importance of uh, the home being uh, the first and primary place of where our children receive their Christian education. Well, in our last few minutes, we'll look at Tuesday's lesson. And this is one of my favorite uh, encounters that Jesus had with someone while he was on this planet. In this case, it was a Samaritan woman. And uh, while this particular Samaritan woman was uh, uh, having this life-changing encounter with Jesus, and again, time does not permit us to be able to look at the whole story, but as she was having this life-changing encounter with Jesus beside a famous historical well that Jacob himself once owned, we find there that she starts to bring up the subject of worship. And because that's our subject here today, I think it is something that can be helpful for us uh, in regards to true worship. So come with me to John chapter 4. We'll go to the Gospel of John chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up with verse 20. John chapter 4, and uh, we're going to pick it up with verse 20. And again, this is where the Samaritan woman brings up the subject of worship. She says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. Okay, And uh, Mount Gerizim, if I remember correctly, is the mountain there by Sakar, her city, and the well of Jacob. Our fathers worshipped you on this, uh, worshipped on this mountain. Now, when, he sa- when she says their fathers, she's talking about, this is Jacob's well, we have to remember. And, uh, and this is the land, as the Bible says in the same chapter, that uh, jo- J- Jacob gave to his uh, son, uh, Joseph. And, uh, and so, friends, there's a deep heritage, the patriarchs of the Jewish people, the patriarchs of the great nation of Israel that came out from their genetic pool and reproduction, friends. It is them that worshipped on that mountain in many centuries uh, past. And she points that out in pride, in religious, in heretical, uh, uh, not heretical, but as a prideful heritage. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place in where one ought to worship. And so this, she points out another contentious issue that was uh, feeding this enmity and this hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. And, uh, and so the Samaritans continue to point to Sakar and Jacob's well as the, as the ultimate place to worship God, if you were to pick a spot. 
And uh, the Jews say, no, no, the temple, the holy temple of God, the Shekinah glory that was once found, sadly was not during the days of Christ and during this encounter, but used to actually dwell in the inner chamber, the most holy place of the temple, the holy city and capital of Israel. This is where you must worship. Jesus doesn't take the bait. He doesn't fall into this contentious issue, but simply says, woman, believe me. And by the way, when he says woman, just as he said to his mother earlier, you know, it, it, this was a, a, a term of respect. It's like saying, ma'am, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. So Jesus is saying, listen, actually both are going to become irrelevant very quickly. Verse 22, you worship what you do not know, but we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So he does very tactfully and indirectly say, you know, actually the Jews are right on this count, but you know what, uh, this is a non-issue uh, starting very quickly here anyway. And, uh, and so let's talk about worship from the heart and what true worship really is in the first place. Verse 23, it says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so Jesus is saying, listen, one day it won't matter what part of the planet you're on. The main thing is that you're worshiping with these two key elements, the spirit and in truth. And, uh, and so friends, these two elements are critical. Now, I just appreciate the way that the author has uh, pointed out the fact that uh, uh, too often as Christians, we have been sold into buying exclusively one or the other. Um, either we're just really into the spirit and truth and doctrine is really irrelevant or kind of falls into the background and uh, backdrop. And uh, really, it's all about having the Holy Spirit and how he makes you feel. And so we become a very emotional kind of based kind of uh, Christian experience. And, uh, and Jesus here is pointing out to the woman as well as you and I, that if we stop simply only with seeking the Holy Spirit, then we're going to find ourselves in deep trouble very quickly. And, uh, and so having the spirit over only is, uh, is not the answer. Uh, having Bible truth uh, intellectually is also a problem. And we find that played out with the Pharisees as well as many other Jews, religious Jews during Jesus' day. Uh, they took great pride in having uh, deep knowledge of the scriptures of God. When King Herod came to the, to, uh, to the Jewish scholars and the scribes of Jerusalem in his day, when the wise men came in and said, where is the Messiah, the King of the Jews? We have seen his star. And so he asked, you know, um, he asked the scholars, where is the Messiah to be born? They didn't have to go to the concordance. They didn't have to look it up. They just said, well, it says in Micah chapter three, I think it is, verse two or something to that effect. And, and uh, you know, in, in Bethlehem of Ephrathah, uh, will he come from? And so they knew their scriptures very well. And so intellectually, uh, they were very well acquainted with the scriptures. They knew vast, uh, some of them knew vast passages by memory. But friends, they had made the mistake of missing the spirit in their life. And so friends, they had a lot of truth, uh, but the truth, Bible truth, even Bible truth without the Holy Spirit leads to a very dangerous spot as well. We can find ourselves into a legalistic self-righteousness that uh, Paul says was the demise of his previous experience and the demise of many, the bulk of religious Jews of his generation as well. And so Jesus very helpfully points out to us that we need to have both. And uh, I just appreciate the, uh, the, um, the quote from Desire of Ages that is given to us on uh, Tuesday's uh, lesson. So if you have your quarterly, you can follow along with me. If not, we can, uh, I'll read it out loud here. That's on page 59. And uh, right around the middle or just below the middle there, uh, there's the quote. And uh, it says, The religion that comes from God is the only religion that will lead to God. In order to serve him aright, we must be born of the divine spirit. This will purify the heart and renew the mind, giving us a new capacity for knowing and loving God. It will give us a willing obedience to all his requirements. This is true worship. It is the fruit of the working of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so friends, we want to make sure that we don't fall into that kind of intellectual, self-righteous, uh, legalistic experience that God is trying to protect us from as well. 
And then again, I want to uh, quote just from the author itself of the quarterly, the very last couple of sentences there. He says, uh, spirit without truth can lead to shallow sentimentalism that's built more on fickle emotion than on anything else. In contrast, truth without spirit can lead to a lifeless formalism. And hence, we need both. And that's what Jesus is teaching the woman at the well that day. And of course, God had made sure that it was recorded, that he might be able to uh, instruct us as, as well. Well, we just have a, a minute or two left in our study here this morning, so we won't be able to look at everything that the quarterly covers and and of course, I always have more that I'm hoping to share than I'm ever able to share. Uh, but friends, I just want to encourage you, if you haven't gone through the quarterly, to make your way through that and, uh, and make sure that you get everything you possibly can out of it. And, uh, and so there is a, uh, a quote that is found on uh, Wednesday's uh, study. So let's close with that particular um, quote. And that is in uh, First Chronicles chapter 16. And verse 29. So, of course, you can find in your Bibles, it's also in the quarterly itself. It says, Give to the Lord the glory, do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord God in the beauty of holiness. And so, friends, the question is asked, what does that mean, the beauty of holiness? Friends, God is holy. You know, there's a statement that's repeated more than once, uh, many times throughout the Bible. Um, in regards to God's character. And that is God is holy and that God is love. And uh, in this case, it's talking about the beauty of holiness. Friends, once you have the Holy Spirit and you're interested in surrendered before the true God and Savior of the world, friends, it is at that point that, uh, that, that God's holiness is beautiful and that you be able to see it in all of its glorious light. And, uh, you know, I was at a conference once and I'll close with this. I was at a big conference with pastors, thousands of pastors there. There was a prominent professor. The other prof- I think the other speaker in one of the seminars was a professor as well, perhaps a pastor. And they had different presentations. One was that the foundational truth about God's character is that God is holy. And the other one said the foundational ca- primary factor of God's character is that he is love. And, uh, and so there's this kind of battle that took place throughout those couple of days. You know, is, is God being love first and foremost or is God being holy first and foremost? And uh, as I've uh, thought and kind of ruminated on that, I'd like to suggest that they're not exclusive one to another, but rather they are very synonymous. Uh, God's holiness is full of pure love. And the fact that God is pure love and all of that love is truly holiness. And I think we make the mistake if we try to separate the two. The two are inseparably connected one to another. God's love is pure holiness and God's pure holiness is pure love. And uh, so friends, we're going to have to close it with that here today. Don't forget to take advantage of our free um, offer that we uh, made at the beginning of the program. Uh, Some of us have missed that particular uh, free offer. So I'm going to just say it quickly here again. The rest of your life, everything you need to know about the Sabbath. And so this is one of the best reads and studies that you can find concerning the fourth commandment Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath of the Bible. And uh, so just call into 1-866-788-3966 as you see on the screen and ask for free offer number 813. And uh, if you want to get a digital download of that, you can from your digital devices, uh, your phone in particular by texting the code SH086. So again, you put that in your message box of your text uh, app and then you want to uh, text that to the number 40544 and uh, you can receive a free digital copy again friends thank you for joining us here again we look forward to seeing you next week as we continue to study through this important subject of christian education